So we would eventually like to get to a point where we have more concrete, more sophisticated empirical evidence of loss aversion than just polling people about their airplane flights. And again, eliciting those hypothetical willingness to pay and willingness to accept that, you know, this particular study, we just pulled people. We don't know for sure that this would actually line up with how people would behave in practice. But it, at least as an approximation, we would hope that we're going in the right direction, that we're eliciting something that is at least an approximation of how people would actually behave. But we do, like we discussed earlier, want to take that further and say, well, do we have concrete data? Do we have concrete examples of this happening that we can document? So we do. I'm going to start with another thought exercise, another question for you here. But this is going to be at least related to your discussion question. So you got a portfolio of stocks. You, you know, you have that structure however you want, but you have to think about, you know, say you want to make a purchase. Say you want to, like, buy a new car or something like that. And you're like, oh, in order to have the resources to buy a new car, I've got to liquidate some of my portfolio of stocks. How do you decide which stocks to sell? Just open up, you know, what do you guys think? Mm -hmm. If you're up on your investments or not. Why? Because then um, you're not you're you're covering any possible losses you have. But if the losses are greater than the wins, then you're just putting yourself into more losses by making the purchase. Why does that matter? And this is sort of this is this is good because this is the, the crux of the issue that we're talking about here. Because it's the wrong money. Does what has happened in the past matter? Yeah. I love that the person directly behind you very vehemently is going like this. <laughs> <laughs> because again, if you're Spock, right? Don't you want to sell the things that aren't that have a lower opportunity cost, right? So if you're saying, all right. If I'm trying to think about what to sell to buy this car, don't you basically want to sell the things that aren't going to go up in the future? That's assuming you think they're not going to go up. But just assume, yeah, assuming obviously we can't tell the future. But what I'm doing is I'm encouraging you to think about, you know, what are those decision mechanisms that we use to make that choice and then think about are those decision mechanisms within this definition of rational? Or, in a way, are we part of the problem? Are we illustrating those things, you know, those biases that are contributing to markets not behaving in the way that we would expect? And, you know, for example, I could say, well, let's say I have one stock. It decreased in price over the last year. So I'm feeling bad about this stock, but I also think that it's going to go up a lot in the future. I have another stock that did well, but I expect it to just sort of level off in the future. What information in there is relevant versus not relevant? Does what the stock did in the past, does that actually matter? No. Because no. we are where we are. We've, we held this stock. Like, if it did poorly in the future, or if it did poorly in the past, that's done. You are where you are today. And even with just like a few minutes of discussion here, I could convince you that what matters is what you think is going to happen in the future. But nonetheless, our knee-jerk reaction is actually in line with what you're saying. Like, has this gone up or down? Either because we're making assumptions about how what has happened in the past correlates to what's going to happen in the future, or because we don't like feeling those losses. So yeah, um, in the investments concept, the professor said to sell losers and buy winners. But then we also like we're talking about like selling losers is kind of painful because you spent the money on it 
and then you kind of, because you're reluctant to just let it go for losing money. Yeah. Because you want to wait and wait until it goes up, but you never know when it goes up. Yeah, so we're going to talk about this more on Thursday. But we seem to have some sort of accounting that we're doing for ourselves where we don't think of paper losses and realized losses as the same, and we don't think about paper gains and realized gains as the same. Yeah, so we're going to see that this loss aversion that we've been talking about plays directly into the biases and behavior that we can see in our investment choices. And I didn't mean to call out anybody on their investment strategies, whatever. It's all totally fine. We're just trying to get a read of what seems intuitive to you. It seems intuitive to me, too. And does that match with what's actually objectively possible?